Okay, we're here at the uh, Sports Legends of Delaware County Museum with two legendary feet, uh, characters here. Uh, Olgi Pentelis, who is one of the best boxers ever to come out of Delaware County, and one of the top boxing historians in the country here, Chuck Hassan, um, is here with his book. Uh, I wanted to ask, we could start out, Olgi, can, can you tell... Um, Tell our viewers how you actually got started in boxing. Uh, well, I used to wrestle in high school, and, uh, and I was just a little crazy at that time, and I used to fight a lot in the streets, and uh, I'd fight all kinds of guys, and I, I, I had men looking for me from North Philly, South Philly, West Philly, all over the place. They were looking for me because I was beating up their friends. So... so uh, a friend of mine said, well, you're fighting in the street all the time. Why don't you try boxing? And that's the only sport I wasn't really interested in. I, I wrestled, I played football, baseball, everything. Uh, and uh, I just, uh, you know, I didn't care for boxing. But I, I, I didn't graduate high school and I was job hopping, job hopping. So one day I went to the gym with my friend um, this other friend and, and watched him box and then I, when I saw it I, I said wow you know I didn't realize you know I, I it just was it was me because I just uh, you know I I'm a nice guy but I'd like to fight <laughs> and no fear so uh, I, I told my friend that uh, who asked me to, to, if I wanted to be box I said yeah let me uh, uh, let me try it, you know. So he got me a manager, trainer, and all that. And and uh, and Marty Feldman was an excellent trainer. He taught me everything I know, especially on a punch. Left hook, right razor. <laughs> I was just saying all the time. And every time I would I would ask Marty, who am I fighting, Marty? And he would say, Tiger Bull. <laughs> Put a little scare in me. Tiger Bull. What, what was that gym you, you had gone to first that you, what was the name of the gym? Passiunk and Moore was the gym. I, I, that was in I, South I, Philadelphia. Yeah, I don't know if it had a name. Uh, Passiunk Gym. Passiunk Gym. And then from there we moved up to Derby Gym. And Marty used to have that store where he sold jeans there on Westchester Park? Right across this caddy corner from the gym, yeah. So before you uh, stopped... Because you, you made a comeback uh, later. Um, I stopped in 71, and I, f and I made a comeback in 77. So your last fight would have been what year? 79. 79. Right, 77 and 79. I fought. My last fight was uh, uh, 79. Now, in, in your mind, did you feel as though... Um, did you ever fight for a, like a North Atlantic or a North American title or any? Just um, yeah, I was ranked in the country uh, number three, I think. I'm not sure. Uh, one of those rankings. They didn't have all them titles back in, in your day. No, just for the, just for the for America, uh, uh, the, the nation. I was ranked something. Yeah, you. I think in the world high. I was 13 or something. Maybe. Yeah. I, I, I know you were pretty high in the rankings. Uh, what, what was your favorite venue? Did you enjoy fighting at the Spectrum? Yeah, it's bigger, cleaner, everything, you know. The arena is where I got my start, you know. That was your first fight? But you know what, well, once you're in the ring, you don't know what's going on out there. I mean, some fighters like to perform and everything, but once I was in that ring, I don't know care where I was, what I was doing, who was out there, who was yelling, screaming. You're just, you're just focused on that man. So I could be fighting in the, in a coliseum, but wouldn't wouldn't know outside. It was like in a phone booth there. Yeah. yeah. How about Atlantic City? I know they were getting started with the casinos. Yeah, I never made it. You there. never fought at the Atlantic no. City. No, no. They wanted me to fight at uh, Blue Horizon when they first opened it up again, and uh, but they were going to give me hardly any, any money. To pay. You know, I was making half decent money at the Spectrum, and they just wanted to get it off the. They were gonna. They were. I guess that was the reason. I don't know. But uh, so I most of your there. <laughs> most of your fights were at the Spectrum. Yeah. And yeah. Augie drew the largest gate and attendance 
uh, in Philadelphia in 40 years for a featherweight fight when he fought Sammy Goss. I think 10,000 people were there. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah for that week. And the promoter was um, Luke, Luke Casey. Luke Casey. <laughs> Don <Donald> Casey. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you look back, um, you don't have any regrets, or you you feel as though um, you accomplished what well, you I wanted. I regret that uh, I got caught up in the sixties with the drug era and the Beatles and all the hippie crap. I really regret that because I might have. I I, I I believe with all my heart I could have been a champion. Uh, but another thing, I used to say to my mom, you know, mom, if I was a good boy and I didn't mess around, I could have been a champion. And she said, yeah, and, and you could have been talking like Muhammad Ali today. <laughs> the, the, you know. So who knows? You know, the Lord has everything in control. I believe in Christ. And he, you know, uh, he guided me through everything. What, what was your record on the street, with street fights? Uh, I can't remember losing. I can't remember losing. Uh, and that's fighting guys bigger than you. Oh yeah, I had a guy from Villanova, a Villanova football player, come down looking for me because I beat up his friend. Boom! I took him down. Got him. I made him submit, just like the MMA today. I did it way before then. <laughs> I don't know. Like I said, I, I I always I always had a good heart. I was I wasn't a mean person. I just like to scrap. I mean, you talking to me? You talking to me? Could have been. I did that. I did, I did that way before De Niro. <laughs> and uh, Chuck, yes, can you hold up your book here uh, so they can see? Um, can. Chuck just did uh, this uh, Philadelphia's. Boxing scrapbook, history, boxing history, history scrapbook. scrapbook, and uh, we're here at a book signing today. But you do have a section in there on Delaware County fighters, yes, do. and you and, have and some Wilmington, Delaware, and Philadelphia's amateur history, and of course the pros, Philadelphia pro history. Um, you have, you do have. Uh, some information in, in there on all of these. I do have information on all of these. And, uh, you know, I mentioned that Augie was one of the biggest drawing cards in, in Philadelphia during the 70s, and that, uh, you know, he drew the biggest gate for a featherweight fight in 40 years in Philly, and that Augie was, uh, had uh, a few little things in the beginning of his career, but he, he found the Lord and he came back and uh, did all right at the end, too. Well, that's good. Um, I, I want to thank both of you for coming out today. Okay, we're here again at the uh, Delaware uh, Sports Legends of Delaware County Museum uh, at our book signing. And we have a former Philly who has made his home in Delaware County, in Aston, Dickie Knowles. Um, Dickie, I wanted to start by asking you um, where you're from and how you got involved in baseball. Well, I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. I grew up there. I still call that somewhat of home, but this is my second home. I've been here longer, and I, I grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina. I've been in Delaware County longer than I was in Charlotte, North Carolina. How do I got started playing baseball? Wow, that was uh, that's a little bit of a long story, but I was playing kickball one day with a friend of mine. I love this little kid, Billy Hoover. He was kind of like my self-esteem. I stuttered in school a lot. And he would do everything for me. He'd speak for me sometimes. Teacher would ask me a question, he would answer it. And uh, so Billy, everything, he, he always, he was like my very dear friend and also like someone that I wanted to be like, you know, and I was nine years old and he, uh, he said, man, you're good at kickball. He says, he said, I want to be on your team. Then the next day he was asking me to go play Little League Baseball. So I went down to play Little League Baseball and I went over to the field and started my career as a baseball player and fell in love with it. 69 Mets was my first Real uh, well, I remember the '67 World Series. I remember the '68, but from '69 after the Mets won the World Series, from that point on, I didn't miss any baseball. Of course, we had, we didn't have cable. We had Saturday game of the week, and uh, and, and you played on your high school team. Oh yeah, I, I started playing a little league. I played pony league, and then I 
I played uh, Legion ball, and then I played uh, uh, my school ball team, and I mean in uh, middle school, and then in high school. Yeah. And did you uh, did you get signed right out of high school? I was drafted out of high school by the Phillies in the fourth round in 1975. In 75. So. Okay. Um, now you were with the Phillies for how many years? Wow, I was with the Phillies 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81. So seven straight years with them, and then I then I went away for some, for some. Uh, I went away to some other teams, came back, and then uh, I ended up with uh, uh, the Phillies in 1990 to end my career. It was not a very very pleasant year, but I came back with them, and I've worked with them now for 30 years after baseball. So with, with that being drafted right out of high school, were you in the minors for how long did you? Yeah, were you I was in, in the minors from 1975 and came up in 1979. I came up to the big leagues July the 4th of 1979. Uh, so I was in AAA in Oklahoma City and uh, made my first start in the big leagues on July the 5th of 1979. And... Uh, why stay in Delaware County? Why, what, what was it about Delaware County that you made your home here? Well, to be totally truthful to you, I, th I thought I would never live in, up north. I thought I was going to go back to North Carolina. And I had the only other place I had lived I, when I was with the Rangers. I, I really liked Texas. I lived there. My wife was from this area, um, and she wanted to come back up to this area. And, and I fell in love with the area. So you've lived here. You've never gone back to no. North Carolina? Been here ever since. Been here since 1989. Um, what, if you had to pick one thing that you really like about Delaware County, what would you say that's different from Charlotte? Well, I think they're uniquely different. I think the thing that uh, uh, golf courses. <laughs> I, lo I love the golf courses up here. I think it's we have some of the greatest golf courses around. And you, you hear people go to Florida to play golf. I, I, I mean, if you get the opportunity to play golf up here, but I really like the people, I like the area, I like, um, um, I mean, it's, you're, you're not far from the mountains and you're not far from the beach. I mean, it's a great area and I think the, uh, the fact that I was working for the Phillies had a lot to do with that and it kind of grew on me over the years. I never thought I'd, like I said, I love North Carolina. When you're born, bred there, I never thought I'd ever leave North Carolina, but uh, this is home. Now, do you get back there? Do you have relatives there? Oh, yeah, I get back there. Uh, I have my brothers and sisters are there. Uh, I have to ask you, everybody said, you got to ask him, <laughs> ask Dickie the story. Of course, the George Brett story, but when you met him years later. Oh, gosh, yeah. Can you tell that story? You know, I just seen a picture on the, you know, I was trying to get some pictures off the Phillies website, and I looked on there, and there was a picture of me and George hugging. I, I had forgot about that. And then when Kansas City came up here to play uh, the first interleague game that Kansas City was playing in, and they had asked me to throw out the first ball with George Brett, and I declined. I mean, I'm a 36-53 lifetime pitcher. This guy's a Hall of Famer. I didn't think that was appropriate, and I threw at his face. So I, uh, I, I declined, and I said, why don't you get Smitty to do that? So that's who did it, Smitty and, and Brett. So we went to dinner. They asked me to go to dinner with him, and we had dinner at Davio's, and and uh, uh, Mr. Middleton and, and Smitty and Brett's down that end with Debbie Nacito. I'm down at this end. I forget who I was with, a few others. Uh, it was rather a large table. So, you know, I was, hey, I'm going to enjoy Davio's. I love the restaurant. and get my bone-in ribeye, kick back, and listen to George Brett and Mike Smith tell stories. And so they had some wine down there. So after a couple of glasses of wine, George came by and he kind of kneeled down. And this is the night before he was throwing out the first pitch. And, he kneeled down. He says, were you throwing at me? And I looked at him. I said, yeah. He goes, oh, I love it. And he went to the bathroom. <laughs> I said, well, I got that out of the way. And I'd done a card show with him years before. And he walked in with a ball glued to his face. So I thought we had settled all this. So he goes back and he's down there talking. And I'm loving what they're saying. They're talking hitting, fielding, and they're talking about baseball. And, you know, Brett and Mike Smith, you know, I, I didn't have to pay for that. I was sitting there listening to it for free. The next thing you know, he gets up again. He's going to the bathroom. He goes, you know, if if I would have got a hit, what I was going to do. I said, no. He said, I was going to take Manny Trio or Larry Boa out to left field, deep left field, if I got a ground ball and break up a double play. I was going to get one of those guys. And I said, I love it. So he went to the bathroom. And then he goes and he comes back and 
they're talking a little bit longer and he gets up again he's going to the restroom and he stops and he goes did you throw up my head you know and i looked at him and i said yeah <laughs> and he didn't say i love it but that's okay <laughs> but he said he, he said okay i got you and uh, i explained to him what i was doing i said you know i was going to get willie mays akins because Aikens had homered in the first off Christensen, homered in the second off me. And on the second one, he stood at home plate, as he did on the first one. And baseball was played different then. And I heard Pete Rose holler at him, hey, Willie, you better run. And I turned around, and I said, well, Rose hollered at him. Man, I better holler at him. So I told him, I said, if you don't run, man, I'm going to drill you. And so that was my intent was to hit him, and I probably was going to hit him in the rear end. But I played for a guy named Dallas Green. And in the minor leagues, Dallas Green told us, why wait? If you get an opportunity to knock somebody down, if you, if you feel like something on the other club's not going right, they're throwing at your guys, well, Dallas was if he was adamant. If they were throwing at our guys, we had to drill them. But if we wanted to knock a guy down, and the, maybe the game dictated that, don't wait. If you get a guy in 0-2, do it. So I got bred 0-2. And, and I said, hey, why wait? So I flipped him. And so that... When he taped the ball, that was a card show. Before yeah, that was the... that was several years before. I was there with Pete Hillman, Pete Rose, and uh, it was a card show in Philadelphia. And I was a little concerned because as I'm sitting here with the great Bobby Chance, I was sitting here at the same kind of table with doing a card show as close as I am to Bobby there. And I, uh, I he sat down, and I was like, whoa. And then on this side of his face, <laughs> he didn't put it on this side because he knew he was over there. He turned and looked at me and said, hey, George Brett. I went, hey, man, how you doing? So I, I, that broke the ice. You know, he had a big, big baseball, like, you know, stuck on his face. With so it was always all in fun. I mean, yeah. He, there was never the a kind, time where he was. No. Nah. I think Brett was the most, um, I think he was the most unfazed person that Fry ran out to protect his superstar. I think George is, you know, he, he, he flipped. And then he spun around, he was facing me, and he was looking at me in anger. I think his whole thing was, hey, if you throw a strike, I'm going to hit one right back at your face. I think that's the way he was wanting to get back. He wasn't going to come to the mound. I think what he wanted to do was, and it is at bat, either hit one off the wall, out of the park, or right at my forehead. But I struck him out. So. Well, i got to ask you, what, what was the feeling like to be part of uh, the Phillies' first World Series? Because, I mean, we waited for years for this. You're, you're on the team, and um, what? You know, my find, you know, fondest moment has something to do with that. It really is. I mean, I was a young 22, 23-year-old kid, and, and I'm down in the bullpen, and Tug's out there with the bases loaded, and he's, 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 they get me up because he's in a situation where if a guy hits a homer, you know, we're up four to one, four runs, you can't keep tugging the game you got to keep him for game seven so I'm the guy that's going to have to go in if, if he gives up anything you know and the game's tied or they're ahead so I'm down warming up in the bullpen and we have the dogs on the field you know I, I'm every pitch I throw I got a dog trying to I think it was a German Shepherd I can't remember trying to attack me and and it's you know it hit me and, and I kind of quit throwing because Tug's about to win the World Series for us. And it hit me because in those days, we knew a lot of the people that worked at the ballpark at the vet. Some Sundays, they would bring us over uh, to their houses and a lot of Italian people there bring us over that worked there, bring us over for good spaghetti and crabs. I never even knew you could cook crabs and spaghetti together. It became one of my favorite <laughs> dishes. And so, you know, Lonnie Smith, myself, Keith Moreland and and Marty Bicer and Bobby Walk, a lot of the families would, you know, guards there and families would cook for us on Sundays. So they would explain to us, you know, about the history of the Phillies that never won. You guys are going to win. You're going to win. You can't, can't let this go. And then when uh, Tug struck out Willie Wilson to end it, just by the fact that we had 65,000, I doubt, probably about 70 at that point. I'm sure everybody that could get in that ballpark any way they could was over there in the ballpark. So just looking at the people, it hit me. I go, this is just not about the Phillies winning. This is, as Dallas Green had, had preached to us, this is about a town that's been very deserving of a world championship and never got one with some right. great players. This is about the fans. This is about an organization. This is about the history of the Phillies. And we're finally going to get over the hump and win, you know, after 76, 7, and 8, which I was in the organization. So it hit me. I looked around. I seen those fans. I never heard some... I'd never heard anything like that before or since when that last out was made. So I ran out on the field, and then I'm looking around, and I'm looking at the people, and I go, wow, this is more than just a, a normal World Series. For me, that's what I got out of it. And then uh, Dallas Green was on the field. Everybody was celebrating. I went into the clubhouse, and he took a bunch of people back out. And, uh, and 
in the clubhouse, sitting in the trainer's room, you could hear that noise. And so that, 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 was, that was, that's one of my fondest yeah. memories of baseball. I have another one that's very similar to that is when we closed the vet and they brought all the former players back. Right. And there's, that, you know, all, it's an hour after the game and about 65,000 people stayed for that. And boy, I tell you, they, they cheered every era and every player equally. So that shows you about the Philly fan. Did you know one of our book signers, did you know that he had that apartment at the vet right around that time? Tom Garvey. I, His book's called The Apartment. For three years, I, I, he lived that's, at the vet. That's Tom Garvey? I know. Yes, yes. I meant to say something to him when I came in this morning when he introduced himself, and I forgot. I, I was going to say, how did you do that? That's, that's incredible. And uh, not many people knew. Well, no I, I, I wondered during those days, I was a little different type of person if he ever seen us running around in the middle of the night there. <laughs> well, he said Bill Bradley knew about it. He played for the Eagles. Yeah. And uh, maybe one other Eagle. Isn't that but something? I didn't know if any of the Phillies knew that he had that. It was I, an old I, storeroom that he made into, and that, he was living there it's crazy. for three years. That's and, amazing. Uh, nobody had any idea. But listen, um, Dickie, it was uh, great you stopping by today. And thanks for making your home in Delaware County, too. It was nice uh, right. that one of our Phillies, because I'm thinking, who still lives? Schmitty's not out by the... Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, Tug, hard. and of course, is no longer with us. And uh, But you're one... Of, are there any other 1980 Phillies that would live in Delaware County? No. No, Larry's out in Conchahawken, Boa. Uh, no. Pulled off the area, but yeah. not so much Delaware yeah. County. Well, we got the big, great Jim Vankowski out there, right? He's my neighbor. Well, you get tired of him walking by your house, though. <laughs> oh, I love seeing the Vankowskis. I love them, man. They're great people. Well, listen, Dickie, thanks for stopping by. Thank you.